So this is the final webinar of the HEAL Community of Practice for 2020. And we thought it would be good to actually talk a bit more about the HEAL project itself and the experiences that we have made in the last, yeah, it's almost been 20 months by now, um, during the inception phase of the project and, and sort of give us some food for thought on how to move on with the operationalization of One Health. So for that, we have two speakers today um, from, from the HEAL project. So I would like to introduce them to you very briefly. So we have um, joining us uh, from Comitato Collaborazione Medica, Nicole Fassendini, who is a public health consultant at CCM. So she is a medical doctor from Italy with an MSc in public health from the LSHDM in the UK. And she is somebody who has an extensive experience in public health in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So definitely relevant experiences for the HEAL project. And she is currently undertaking a second MSc um, in One Health, looking at uh, how to operationalize One Health um, among pastoralist communities in East Africa. Uh, Nicole has been instrumental, like from the beginning of the planning of the HEAL project, so and, and has also made sure that her experiences um, sort of fed into developing the concepts we're trying to follow, follow in HEAL. So Nicole will talk to us about how to operationalize and experiences with that. Um, but first up, the first speaker of today is going to be Diana Onyango, um, who is based um, or, or worked for Veterinaire Sans Frontières Suisse, which is the lead um, agency for the HEAL project. And, and she used to be based in Ethiopia. She is a vet from Kenya uh, with an MSc in vet equity and public health. Um, and Diana has led the project as a project manager during the inception phase and has in that role been absolutely pivotal to develop the phase one, so the implementation phase in which we are currently in the HEAL project. Unfortunately for HEAL, Diana is now pursuing a career change in Kenya. Um, but we are really glad that she is with us today to share all the important insights from the inception phase with us and, and also highlight what, what the key findings were and what we need to think about in the future work under the HEAL project. So thanks a lot, Diana, that, that you made time today. Um, I think you took up your new role earlier this week, so we're really grateful for you that you joined us for, for this webinar today. And with that, I would like to pass or hand over the work to you, Diana, for the first part of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Barbara, for the introduction. Uh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, or Greetings to everybody. Some of you, I'm sure, you're in different time zones. Uh, so today, uh, I'm just going to make a brief presentation on the work that we have done in the inception phase of um, the Hill project. I'm also focusing on the results of the assessments and the surveys um, that we did in the past uh, 20 months of the project. So, um, Saba, please, uh, Jim. So just as an introduction, I uh, just wanted to give an overview, maybe for those who may not be familiar with the, with the with context of pastoralism in the Horn of Africa. We know that uh, over 16% of the population in the Horn of Africa, uh, in, in Africa are pastoralists and over 30 million of that are found in, in, um, in the Horn of Africa. Um, and the challenges that these pastoralist communities face are, are it is, I mean, regardless of which country they're in, is usually more or less the same. Uh, we have inadequate access to services. This is human health, animal health, and other services, public services in these communities because they are found in very remote areas. There's inadequate institutional capacity, particularly of the public um, service delivery uh, systems. 
And these communities are also faced uh, with recurrent droughts uh, this, uh, um, that has, has been seen in the current years. There is inadequate infrastructure and, and uh, increased competition for resource and associated conflicts that comes along with this um, resource competition in, in these areas. So this basically formed the next slide, please. This basically formed the context for which the, the project was developed uh, and the rationale of the collaboration between the three organizations, that is BSF Swiss, ILRI and uh, CCM was based on the experience uh, of the, the extensive experience of the three organizations in implementing various projects in the Horn of Africa, particularly with the One Health approach. And of course, the long-term uh, ground presence of these three organizations in the countries where we're implementing this project. So we have um, VSF Swiss being the lead organization. Uh, it's the technical lead in terms of livestock and animal health uh, thematic areas of the HIMP project. Um, CCM is the technical lead on human health, um, the thematic area, and ILRI is the technical lead on the NRM component. So that shows the complementarity of the organizational experience that brings, uh, that the three organizations have. Next slide. So um, the, the project had two specific objectives um, in the inception phase. And the first one was to examine the, um, the priorities and expectations of uh, the key stakeholders in the project. This key stakeholders being one, the communities um, that we are um, um, planning to support with improved service delivery. The next uh, major stakeholder, of course, is the government, um, particularly the human health and animal health uh, public service uh, departments or sectors, uh, because they are key in the, in the project, uh, I mean, the success of the project uh, objectives. The other stakeholder being, of course, the donors. Uh, but, um, Starting with the, with the government, we, we carried out a context analysis. Next slide. We carried out a context analysis of the One Health policy in the, um, in the three countries of interest. Uh, and also just to understand, I mean, to undertake a needs assessment at a, at a national level. And in doing this, we looked at um, uh, particular components related uh, to the operationalization of One Health in the government systems. So we looked at governance, we looked at networks and partnerships, um, issues like communication, operational research, yeah, and monitoring and evaluation. Uh, the main gap that we, we found from this context analysis is there's a non-existence of a government policy to anchor One Health specific strategies in, in the three countries. None of the country has a One Health specific policy. Uh, and this, of course, contributes to poor funding of One Health related activities. Uh, this then, th th you find that the government structures are very reliant to donor support when it comes to implementation of One Health specific uh, projects or um, interventions. Uh, nonetheless, we see that there's a growing multi-sectoral coordination uh, in, 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 the, in the key uh, sectors that are involved uh, or that are working in One Health. Uh, and the, the, there's different uh, government-led platforms and structures that are growing and are being well-coordinated um, in these countries. So there's, there's um, slow and steady growth towards uh, operationalization of One Health in the three countries. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so I mentioned there's communication and advocacy we looked at. Uh, operational research, what kind of research is there in the three countries that is uh, specific on One Health. We looked at monitoring and evaluation, um, particularly of uh, One Health related uh, projects. Next, please. Uh, the next stakeholder, as I mentioned, is the communities and communities are a major stakeholder in this, in this project because the project is um, is uh, you know the project design is very participatory and context specific. So of course the 
the communities are very much involved in all stages of the project uh, uh, development uh, process. So uh, we establish what we're calling the multi-stakeholder innovation platforms uh, in each of these intervention sites. And these platforms are basically uh, uh, a space for learning and change for the communities, a platform for which they can, uh, they can share their, uh, their challenges and also develop or come up with solutions that, uh, for the challenges that they are facing. So for in the Hill project, this MSIPs, oh sorry, the, the, the constitution of this MSIPs uh, is varied. It not only uh, does it include the pastoralists themselves, but it also includes the uh, public and uh, private service providers. Uh, we have uh, community groups representatives. This could be representatives from women groups, youth groups, and also extension agents. So the membership was as varied as possible to make sure that there is a very good representation of the community uh, members in these platforms. So in the Hill project, the way these platforms were, uh, were engaged, uh, they were used to identify the best um, modalities for implementing the One Health units. Thus, they were involved in the assessments and the surveys that, they were, that, we, implement, that we carried out in this um, phase of the project. And of course, the information and the feedback that was gathered from these uh, discussions and meetings with these MSIPs was key in the development of the next phase of the project. Next. Then the other component of the project is the context analysis, where now we carried out several assessments and surveys uh, that um, that were going to give us the information of the foundation um, and the justification for the implementation and the piloting of the One Health units that we are planning to do in the next phase of the project. So there are several uh, um, assessments that were done. The first one being the mapping uh, or validation of the livestock migration routes. Next slide, please. This one was done using um, the participatory rangeland management uh, approach, which is a stepwise uh, process of, of identifying and improving rangeland management. Uh, this, this process is, is uh, purely community-led and the, the, the external agent, now the NGO is purely a, a facilitator in the process. So the communities are the ones who take lead in this process of uh, identifying and um, assessing the various issues that, uh, that um, or the various objectives of the assessment. So for, the, for us, for in this stage, we are assessing the nature of the rangeland units, boundaries, the status of the grazing plants in areas where the grazing plants were existing, the status of the rangeland management um, uh, institutions or units uh, where they were existing, and other uh, unique site characteristics re relevant to rangeland management in the areas that we were what we were working in. Next. So from this uh, assessment, we were able to identify um, activities or actions that can be carried out in the next phase of the project. And some of these include improving community governance or supporting community governance of the rangelands. Uh, supporting rangeland management uh, activities. And these, of course, are activities that will be identified by the communities themselves. Uh, working on relations with neighboring communities because, you know, um, the rangeland units uh, uh, do not have or do not follow administrative boundaries. Uh, some of these are, are traditional or cultural boundaries. And of course, we have to see how do the communities relate with, the, with their neighbors and also relations with the government and the traditional system. So these this, uh, are the key areas in which um, will be implemented or will be included in the next phase of the project to improve on rangeland management. So, uh, sorry, I, I have briefly touched on this. Um, yeah, the key gaps to support the rangeland health enhancing communication uh, among the hierarchical uh, levels. Uh, and of course, also integration of livestock health into, into the rangeland management plants. 
and of course the strengthening the existing rangeland management units in the in the different areas. The next assessment um, was the anthropology research. And this one was uh, was basically done to to understand uh, the perceptions, perceptions, needs and behaviors of the pastoralist communities towards the human and animal health service provision. And of course, to understand the um, uh, to, to, to understand um, their, sub, uh, their, their approaches towards uh, accessing services. So um, the main results uh, following this uh, uh, anthropology results, uh, I mean research, sorry, showed that change is evident also in, um, I mean, throughout the field activities. Uh, sorry, I think I just lost my, my notes. Sorry, the main results, yes. Um, showed that uh, one of the, th the key things was that religious leaders are, are very key when it comes to accessing services. You find that communities would consult religious leaders when someone is sick. Um, we also saw that communities put a lot of importance on treating livestock diseases uh, above their own, uh, their own um, health. Uh, this is because they, they really value the livestock being the main assets of, of their livelihood space. Communities also, we saw that they do not perceive climate change as a major crisis. To them, it's something that is a temporary variation, variation in weather patterns, and it's something that will pass, and eventually the weather patterns or the climate uh, patterns will go back to, to normal. Uh, now, just coming down to the major uh, assessment that was carried out, the One Health Vulnerability Capacity and Needs Assessment. This was done also in all the project areas that we are working in. And the objective was to identify the needs of the service providers, to identify the needs of the post, uh, pastoralist communities, to identify the gaps that the communities might be uh, I mean, the gaps and challenges that the communities might be facing when it comes to accessing uh, uh, human health and animal health service provision. And from this, we were able to come up with recommendations to improve service delivery in these pastoralist communities. So the way this assessment was carried out, we had a, a number of interviews. We carried out key informant interviews. Uh, and these key informants included um, uh, public and pub, uh, and private service providers from the um, the regional level to the to the village level or Kabele level. We also conducted focus group discussion with the community groups, and we, we 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 were targeting different groups to make sure that we get a voice from different uh, representations of the communities. We have we had discussions with the men, women, and also youth. Uh, and we also conducted the uh, health facility as assessments. So we conducted a total of, of 29 assessments of uh, human and animal health facilities. And um, yes, from this uh, assessment, the main findings included um, these, generally the, there's a poor state of health facilities in the areas that uh, we had carried out this assessment. We have uh, the facilities have inadequate supplies. Uh, they, they do not have the um, equipment and services to be able to, uh, to offer even the basic health services uh, to the communities. Uh, and some of these facilities are also in very remote areas. Uh, so there's a logistical challenge faced with accessing these facilities by the communities. And there's also the logistical challenge of supplies of drugs and uh, essential drugs and, uh, and vaccines and other inputs to these facilities. Um, the other major th thing that came out was the inadequate funding and the resources uh, of the government run facilities, uh, which also leads to an unmaintained infrastructure, a poor service delivery, uh, and poor coordination, communication and monitoring of the staff who are working uh, in these areas. So, and this, the general shortage of quality essential drugs also in these um, areas where we carried out the assessments. And we also noted that there is um, a lot of contraband and counterfeit uh, human and veterinary uh, drugs in these areas. 
So um, next, please. So from this, we were able to see and identify the needs um, such as rehabilitation uh, of the health facilities, the needs for capacity building of the frontline workers, uh, both uh, in terms of improving their, their knowledge and improving the, the kind of uh, resources that they, they have or they need to be able to provide better services. There is also need to improve access to quality and essential drugs and supplies to this uh, uh, um, service points or service locations that are found in the, at the village level. Uh, we could also see that the, the community um, have, they have a need for health education and extension services uh, because the service providers who are able to serve the community at, uh, at the very uh, remote or village level, most of them are not, uh, are not well trained. This could include the community animal health workers or the community health workers. So there is also need to support the extension service and also to improve the community uh, health education. Uh, and it was also noted that partnerships are, are also essential or are needed at different levels uh, within the local and international uh, organizations to maximize the, the synergies uh, and also to improve on um, supporting the service delivery, uh, uh, in, particularly for the very remote uh, areas. So uh, I will now hand over to Mikol who will talk about uh, One Health units and how they now come in to address some of these challenges that are were identified in this assessment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Uh, thanks a lot sir, for this uh, introduction and uh, presentation of uh, these instrumental uh, activities that was run by the Hill project during the inception phase. Uh, as Diana was saying, I will concentrate more my presentation on the One Health units, which are the one of the core activity of the HEAL project. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the idea is really to uh, develop, establish and monitor a new service delivery model, which is integrated, participatory and evidence based uh, to make sure that we can increase the accessibility to health among the pastoral communities. And uh, uh, you will see in my presentation that I will, I will repeat a lot what has been said up to now by Diana, because uh, really what we wanted to do is to make sure that we assessed um, the needs and the, um, and the needs and the gaps at community level to be able to uh, effectively respond to them according to the real um, capacity that is uh, there on the ground and the real needs that are requested by uh, the pastoral community. So what we did, uh, uh, next slide please, we developed uh, what we call the standard operating procedure, which uh, um, uh, it is, uh, first of all, a living document. So we start developing it um, at the beginning of the project just by building on the findings of the research on this and the assessment. So making sure that the evidence could guide us, could guide our choices and our um, uh, approaches in the community. We could enrich it with a number of ex field experience that we uh, managed to, um, to, to test uh, in, in, um, on the field while we were working together. So um, as, as Diana said, we are a consortium of three organizations, uh, VSF, Hillary, and CCM. And at CCM, uh, we, starting, we had the opportunity uh, of adding some little funds um, besides the, the, the Hill project that allow us to uh, test some of these uh, approaches directly on the ground. Of course, this was excellent to gain some experience to be joined with the evidence uh, collected through the, through the assessment. And then, of course, it was essential to discuss uh, all what we found on the ground and uh, through our experience uh, to, through, with different uh, expertise and uh, through the different experts 
uh, from the human perspective, human health perspective, veterinary health perspective, and of course the, the natural resource management to try and identify a way to operationalize uh, at our best uh, the One Health approach in pastoral communities. Though the standard operating procedure allow us to uh, develop what we call the One Health unit. Uh, next slide, please. There are some uh, uh, guiding principles for the One Health Unit. First of all, it, has, it must be integrated. That means that the main objective is really to make sure that uh, um, healthcare delivery is integrated for human and animal health services together with rangeland services. Second point, it is essential that uh, the, the, the service that we are provided is aligned with any kind of activity, a similar activity that is run by national or, or, or at national or regional or district level. So to be sure that we are able to align our services to the uh, national priorities and national plans. We do not want to establish a parallel system but rather build on the essential system, on the one that is already existing, to make sure that it better respond to the needs of the pastoral community. As already Diana was, uh, was saying before, a key element that came out clearly from the need assessment is the importance of the partnership. Partnership that must be across the different sector, that means across the human, the animal, and the environmental sector, as well as at all levels. So we, may, we need to make sure that we involve the community level, the district level, and the, and, and, and the, the, the national level to make sure that we in, integrate and we are sure to provide a service that is uh, adapted to the local tank context. So it is essential that is contextualized to the, to the needs in a specific area, and at the same time respond to the national uh, priorities. Of course, another important guiding principle is the fact that we want to make sure that the, the One Health Unit help to improve the accessibility to services and at the same time, the utilization of these services by the pastoral community. So we need to make sure that we reach them. And, and finally, the idea is, as I was saying before, with the standard creating of the procedure, we are thinking at a living document. So at something that develop in time. So collect continuously collecting evidence from small scale intervention at village level that could help us, guide us to scale the service at a district level and inform, influence in, in the long run also the development of policy at national and regional level. So the idea is really to have a testing, a model at a small scale that will allow us to influence in the long term also national and regional uh, policy. So how do we do it? Next slide, please. So the setup of the One Health Unit start straight from the community. Diana was clearly explaining the essential role that the uh, multi-stakeholder innovative platform uh, play within the project. While the MSIP are still at the core of the One Health Unit because they are the one that should guide uh, the uh, identification of need and the uh, identification discussion of solution to address this need. So the, the community through the MSIP are at, are at the center. Starting from there, we have to link them to uh, the, the, the local authorities, of course. So to make sure that uh, we do have also the institution to support and make sure that uh, the, M the, the one health units are aligned to the system that is already in place. So the, the, the idea is to establish a One Health Task Force at district level, which will be composed of the different, uh, of the representative of different uh, sectors. So the human health sector, the animal health sector, 
the environmental sector, but also any other sector that is essential in that specific area, and that will be responsible together as a one L task force to the uh, impl planning, implementation, and monitoring of the one health unit. You will see later, but uh, as we said before, the one health unit uh, has been uh, designed to be flexible and adaptable to each and every different context in the different geographical areas. So uh, it will be essential that MSIP and the One Health Task Force will decide on the most suitable One Health model. What is the most suitable One Health model that best respond to the needs of that specific community? Starting from them, we will have to go into the capacity building of the mainly of, of the local authorities, but mainly of the frontline service provider that will be responsible of bringing the health, the, the health services, the integrated health services to the community. And then of course, there will be a phase of planning activities and the procurement all the, the, the needed material to set up the one health unit. It will be essential to have a strong monitoring system and monitoring plan, because as, as, uh, as we said before, this wants to be a learning experience. So it will be essential to follow carefully uh, uh, how things are going, what are the challenges, what are the problems, what are the outcomes, what are the results, to make sure to build on lessons learned and capitalize the, the best practices. And of course, we know that the One Health Unit uh, will not be sustainable if they are stand alone. They, they must be integrated into the already existing system. And so it will be essential that they, there is a clear referral system between the One Health Unit and all the other services. Of course, the One Health Unit, I'm speaking, uh, giving uh, the example of the, of the human health, will not be able to provide all the services in place, but it is essential that we'll identify a problem and we we'll refer the specific uh, person to other services if and when necessary. Next slide, please. So why do we want to uh, have an approach that is flexible? As I was saying before, it is essential that the, the, the the one health unit respond to what is really happening on the ground. So uh, the idea and what we have been testing in, in these months in, in small scale is either to uh, support a mobile um, one health unit, that means a, a really a mobile uh, unit uh, made up of a, of a vehicle where we have uh, uh, a, 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 an integrated mixed team composed of uh, human, animal, environment, health service providers uh, that move together and reach the most remote area uh, where pastoral community are. Otherwise, we may have also static uh, mobile unit, uh, sorry, uh, one end unit. So a unit that uh, is more like an infrastructure it's not necessary that is the same place, the same help post that delivers uh, services for both animals and animals. But what is important is that we do have an infrastructure where um, a, a service provider coming from the different sector can meet together, discuss together the problems and uh, identify together a solution. And of course, there may be also what we call the mix approach. So, uh, something that uh, uh, put together both the static and the mobile approach to make sure that uh, respond in, in to, to the needs of the different communities in the best way. So of course, we will have to identify some specific criteria that will help us to uh, uh, set up the different uh, uh, approaches. So it depends on the population, whether it is settled or a nomadic population, we can easily understand that if we are in front of a community that is uh, uh, nomadic and is keeping on moving, we really need to set up a mobile one unit, where if the majority of the population is settled down, we could also consider it a, a, a static one unit. 
Of course, also the geographical accessibility and the size of the target area will be important, as well as the type of seasonality and seasonality of the diseases in the area. And then, as I was saying before, it is essential that the service, uh, the One Health Unit are integrated in what is already existing in the ground. So it will be essential to discuss and decide together with the local authorities what is the best approach for the community according also to what is already um, available. Uh, and then again, of course, uh, the availability of, of the actors, the, the, the resources already put in place, the cost and the sustainability of the service. Next slide, please. So what are the key actors that are involved in, uh, um, in the setup and in the, in, the, in the implementation of the one health unit? Of course, as we said before, uh, at the core, there will be the community, so the MSIP. Uh, the multi stakeholder innovation platform. They will be the, 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 the key actors in that. But then we will have the local authorities from all the concerned sector. We always speak about the, 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 the human and animal health and the environment. But as I was saying before, uh, we may have also other sectors involved in, in the process. So it will uh, really depend on the context and the village, and we will have to build on that. And then as already mentioned before by, by, by Diana, what we discover through the different researches is how the religious leader play an essential role in the uh, therapeutic uh, um, choices of uh, uh, pastoral communities. So it will be essential to have them also as a partner in the establishment of the uh, One Health Unit. And of course the private sector um, private uh, um, private providers uh, uh, are playing an essential role in a pastoral community, and it is therefore really important not to exclude them, but really to bring them together and make sure that we can build a, a response and a, a delivery model that uh, is integrated and that best suits a specific uh, um, context. Of course, the one health unit will be made of, or of a frontline service provider. So uh, health workers, animal health technician, environmental agent, and community expert. These will be the, the people that will be directly responsible of delivering the services. Which type of services? Uh, the package uh, is, 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 is very and uh, maybe uh, quite extensive, but what we want to focus on essential is uh, uh, education and preventive promotive services. Education, and in this case, it will be important to focus specifically on, uh, um, uh, on education and awareness about hygiene and zoonosis. We are testing the use of these community dialogue days on one health issue at community ladder that are run by the one health unit. So um, dialogue days that allow the community to discuss uh, around uh, one specific one health issue from different perspectives. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we do deliver also some services like vaccination uh, for both humans and animals antenatal family planning and grow monitoring services, mainly for the, for, for the women and of course for, for the children under five. And at the same time also, next slide please, some uh, um, uh, medical consultation that will be there uh, both for, for, for the human, of course, medical consultation, but also provision of curative services uh, for, for the animals. And then uh, um, next slide, uh, Saba, thank you. And then of course, uh, it will be important to use the One Health Unit uh, as uh, an entry point to, for surveillance, uh, to make sure that uh, we, we monitor uh, the, 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 the potential occurrence of outbreaks or, or, or diseases at, at, um, at community level and that uh, uh, we immediately uh, report and support the response uh, together with the local authorities. Next slide, please. Of course, uh, uh, we are just at the beginning. I mean, uh, we have been working already for 20 months, but mainly uh, together 
but mainly analyzing the, the problems and analyzing the needs of the, um, of the community and building on those to make sure that we can properly respond to them. And the one health unit is one of the response. Uh, we have already anticipated some, some challenges uh, uh, because we know that once we will set up uh, uh, this kind of response, uh, we will have to face uh, some problems to ensure the sustainability. The cost, first of all, the sustainability in the long run, and then, uh, uh, of course, the long-term engagement of all the actors. So if we want something that is sustainable and that is in fully integrated and aligned with the existing system, we need to make sure that the actors are always engaged in, in the concept. And as, as, um, as Diana was saying at the beginning, uh, there is still not much uh, sub political support uh, in the different countries. It's something that is building up, uh, but is still not so strong. So it will be important why we'll develop and work with the One Health Unit, continuing working also on the advocacy and making sure that we engage as much as possible all the actors at different level on the importance of this kind of response. And then of course, it will be essential to work on the an effective integration of services including financial resources. This is one of the key issues for the One Health Unit to be sustainable in the long run. The project will support the setup and the starting of the One Health Unit from a financial perspective, but the aim is little by little to make sure that the One Health Unit is fully recognized as a service delivery model that can um, work well among the uh, pastoral communities and therefore to make sure that the, it becomes a funded, budgeted for within the different um, sectors at uh, uh, district and uh, national level. So of course the importance and the challenge will be also to make sure that what is being learned at a small scale on a village level can be gradually uh, scaled to a district level and then to a, a regional or a provincial level and then to a national level. So it's something that uh, will not be used, uh, will not be easy to establish. So that's why it will be uh, really essential to monitor uh, the, the, the achievements and the challenges in, in, during the implementation and to make sure that we do um, build on them and we address them as they come. So this is uh, basically our, our aim for the, for, for, for the future. Uh, as Diane was saying, we are, we are at the end of the inception phase and we are starting uh, the, the phase one. We just started the phase one in the month of November in which we will start really implementing and learning uh, together how to better adapt the, the, this new service delivery model for uh, pastoral communities in, North, in, in East Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Diana, and thank you very much, Nicole, for, for your insight. I, I, I think there's a, a lot of information to, to digest here, but I think what is clearly coming out also of your presentation, Nicole, is that that learning process is, is right there from the beginning. And, and I, from, from my experience, this inception phase and the different activities there um, has set up has, has set us up well to, to really engage in that learning process and, and also to critically reflect early on about possible challenges that we will face in, in implementing the One Health Unit. Um, and we're, I think we're very much aware that things will have to adapt over time. Um, and that's very much what we actually want to do. So um, with that, I would like to open the floor if there are any questions from those who are online. Or any comments or anything to add from what has already been said. Uh, this is Helen. Yes. Hi, Helen. Please go ahead. 
Hi, Diana and um, Nicole. I wish to appreciate your contribution. They have been very helpful. In Isiolo, we have been able to do a multi-sectoral uh, training in all the uh, key departments for One Health. And this information that they have shared is going to help me during our next uh, way forward on how to uh, establish One Health unit in this uh, uh, county. So the information that they have shared at least has given me an idea of how to approach uh, our next uh, scenario and uh, the task force that we have formed. So I really wish to appreciate this uh, 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 meeting and I wish that we can continue to collaborate sharing this information for those who are starting this new concept in the counties. Thank you very much. Absolutely, very, very important point. Thank you, Helen. Do we have other, other comments or if anybody would like to make? Hello, this is Esther. Hi, Esther, please go ahead. Thank, yes, thank you so much, uh, um, Diana and Nico. Um, private sector, I mean, SDC wanted us to push a bit more that we, we work more, even more with the private sector. Huh? I mean, we have seen uh, how widespread private sector oper operations are now also in the very remote uh, areas. And it, uh, it was uh, emphasized also that uh, they, they will be key also in this uh, One Health unit. However, <clears throat> we then decided that in phase one, we, we focus more on strengthening of governmental uh, services uh, because we cannot do all at the same time. But in, in second phase, uh, we, we want to assist more so the private sector. I just wonder if in phase one, we shouldn't have more elements of strengthening the good framework conditions for the private sector, such as establishing also a quality control of drugs and vaccines, because this may be a, a main hindering block for the private sector, actually the absence of these governmental services. Um, so what is your take on this? Should we should we assist more the private sector already in phase one in a more indirect way by strengthening the framework conditions they, they need to, to really have a business plan? No, I think that's a, that's a really good point, Esther. And, and so maybe this phase one could help us to focus on how, um, to bring in the private sector more and, and sort of creating, as you say, that more sort of enabling environment as well. Um, so I think that that could be a good way forward. Yeah, I, I personally agree, uh, Barbara, with you and with Esther as well. Um, I think that during the first uh, months, uh, in, during the inception phase, we really focus a lot on, on, on understanding which are the, 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 the different actors. Probably in the, at least in the first months of, the, um, of phase one, we will have to uh, start creating relationship with them because, uh, um, I mean, we have met them, we've discussed with them, we discussed with them about the challenges, but I don't know if we, had already spent enough time with them in identifying the possible solution and they really, what do they need to be um, fully engaged? So probably uh, it will be a gradual process, but uh, I agree with you, Esther, that uh, uh, eventually we will have also to work a lot on the framework to make sure that uh, there are suitable environment for them to um, to be fully engaged and to be fully part of the of the one unit. Mm 